everyone so today I wanted to actually do a little bit of a weekend vlog with you because I am actually this is the first time I've talked this morning um, I have sort of like perpetual cold and perpetual allergies but <clears throat> that's neither here nor there um, because I am doing some fun art stuff and reading book stuff um, and I thought you might like to come along. So today I am going to an art demo for an art group that I'm a part of. Um, and I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time for other artists that are out there who are maybe younger or that sort of thing. If your community has a society of artists or an arts council or something like that, I would highly recommend joining. My experience has been really, really positive and I don't live in a city that has necessarily a huge arts community. Um, but I think it's really helpful to take advantage of these things. I am by far the youngest person who participates in this. Most of it is um, people who are maybe of like more of a retirement age and that sort of thing, um, or have been retired even for a very long time. <laughs> it, it's a bit of a morbid joke, but a lot of times like the roster updates when people pass away. So these are, you know, very experienced painters is what I've discovered is like, um, it's partially because they probably have more time to be able to participate in this sort of thing because they're not working full time anymore. Um, but it's also like they've been painting for years and years and I have learned so much from participating in this community. And of course, they're very eager to get new young people to participate and to you know, be a part of the group because it's dwindling in size because younger people aren't joining. And I feel like I, it's an embarrassment of riches, like because I am sort of one of the most novice painters there, like I feel like I'm getting so much out of it. And along with that, there's a lot of opportunities with this particular organization. They organize shows, juried shows and things like that, that you can participate in very low cost fee. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things that really helps you gain exposure and get to, you know, growing your art career in your local community and growing your work and learning a lot and having the opportunity to have your work judged and get feedback from professional artists and that sort of thing. So it's something that I don't really hear. I follow a lot of art people on YouTube, um, a lot of art content creators who do a fantastic job and um, a lot there, you know, they tend to be like fully in their professional art career or perhaps, or on the other end of the spectrum, just starting off their professional art career and moving into selling, um, originals and prints like online and building just an online community. But if you're looking to get into galleries or participate in your local community, I think that can be a really great way to grow your art and that sort of thing and grow your abilities, get exposure to different artists in your community. And I think, you know, I think arts communities in many cities are probably um, not as robust as they could be unless you're living in like New York or San Francisco or LA or, you know, some of these big metropolitan areas, um, then there's probably a huge arts community that you get to participate in. But if you live in a, you know, a moderately sized city or even a smaller town, like a lot of times, um, the arts community suffers as a result of not being quite um, population dense. And so if you're an artist, like, I think there's just a richness in participating in your community and, and you get so much out of it. And so anyway, I would just encourage you to do that because for me, it has proven to be just an absolutely invaluable resource and such a positive experience. Um, in addition to that, I uh, tomorrow have my Lit Society meeting. I'll link my video up above where I um, interviewed my two friends who started our literary society. And uh, so you can get a sense of what that's all about. It's slightly different than a book club. Um, and this month we are meeting and talking about cookbooks actually. Normally we talk mostly about novels, sometimes nonfiction comes up and that sort of thing, but nothing like pragmatic necessarily like cookbooks. So this is our first cookbooks meeting and what we're going to do is bring our favorite cookbook and bring our favorite recipe out of that cookbook to share with everyone so that we can all enjoy. So it's going to be a magnificent feast of a, a literal feast and, a, and an intellectual feast and it will be great and we will have a really wonderful time. So depending on how comfortable everyone is with that, I will try to get some clips and share a little bit of that with you guys as well. 
Um, and then I'll probably try to share my cooking with you because I will be obviously creating, cooking one of my recipes to bring. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk with you about is the book that I'm currently reading. So I am reading The Woman Destroyed by Simone de Beauvoir. And um, obviously she's very famous. This is a very famous book. Don't you love this cover? I mean, okay, so I wanna, this is, this is like a, a non-entity topic, but one of the things that I find like really annoying about living in modern society, I guess, is the um, shortcuts we make to make judgments about people. So a really easy example is like judging people based on the sort of alcohol that they like or the kind of drinks that they order. Um, and then it's like, oh, you're into beer. Then it's like, oh, you're a pick me girl or like, only dudes are into beer, or like if cocktails are girly or whatever, you know, having these sort of completely arbitrary impressions of people based on what sort of alcoholic beverage they like to <laughs> imbibe, you know, and I think it's just so absolutely stupid because it's stereotyping basically, you know, and, but, and at the same time, I kind of feel that way about like stereotyping people based on the books that they like <laughs> that they choose to read and yet at the same time this is a cool girl cool girl book no doubt and i feel like a cool girl carrying this around and reading it i hate that like because of course like look i have been a, an absolute nerdy uncool person my entire life i remember being in like third or fourth grade and being like oh I know that I'm never going to be cool. I'm goofy. I, you know, ha I like reading classics. I did my classical studies degree. I like dusty tomes, you know. And while I think that makes me a very likable person, it definitely doesn't make me cool. I'm, I'm not cool like this. And so despite my best efforts of trying to resist, you know, stereotyping, I find myself being very pleased by the stereotype that this book would make me fall into. Anyway, let me know if you know if you ever feel that tension <laughs> between both rejecting stereotypes but sometimes participating in them because we live in the society, we cannot fully unplug from it as much as we may find it problematic or um you know, certain elements of it undesirable. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about the first, I've finished the first short story in here, it has three, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of uh, sort of my advice on reading short stories, like, and reading them for analysis and for deeper um, understanding. And um, because the structure of short stories is obviously different than novels, and so I personally read short stories a lot less frequently than I read novels, so I have to kind of like get myself back in the game of thinking about short stories the way that you kind of need to to be able to do it. So anyway, I figured it might be helpful for some people um, because that's what we like to do here. We like to read deeply. I like to give analysis and that sort of thing. And sometimes the how-to of how to read closely uh, gets lost in the content that I create, which is totally fine. I did a series a long time ago when I first started my channel of like how to read more analytically, but that's probably due for an update because and I have a better camera and I'm now better on camera and that sort of thing. Anyway, I'm getting far afield from my point. So let's go ahead and jump into like how I approached reading this story and what I got out of it and how you can kind of use these same techniques to read other short stories. Okay, so the first thing that you want to be aware of when you're reading a short story is that there is a much more simplistic sort of um, conflict and resolution structure that you're going to be encountering but because it's a short story like the type of conflict might be quite a bit more hidden or more subtle or more unexpected than you would see sort of like in a typical novel where uh you know the type of story that you're encountering especially if you're in reading genre fiction this sort of conflict and resolution is pretty much set out for you by the genre of the book um, and short stories in a lot of ways can be genre defying the first story is titled the age of discretion and already you are getting um, a sense of what the story is going to be about which has to do with age with old age um, and what is you know, maybe what you need to do at a certain age in your life. And um, 
the very first line is, has my watch stopped? So this is a sense of dealing with the consequences of time and age already from the very first line. It, you know, it's kind of like poetry, like in a sense, each word becomes even more valuable and even more important and even more like heavy with meaning because there's so many fewer, so much, yeah, there are fewer words. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say um, compared to obviously a novel. No, but its hands do not seem to be going around. So here we have this sense of the our main character who is a first person not narrator sort of choosing to step outside of time kind of refusing to the reality of time right and and that becomes um the part of the main conflict which is her not being to reconcile herself with her old age then we go into a whole section of the knob of the story where she's talking about how the the unity that she feels with her spouse Andre they've been married for a long time she talks about how connected they are um, how the little moments in life have helped them to be connected how comfortable they are in their marriage and their relationship um, etc etc and at the end of the novel we have her reconciling herself to old age and reconnecting in unity with Andre in between the conflict is that Andre has reconciled himself to his old age and she's refusing to do so that creates disunity between them and then they can reunify at the end when she reconciles to the fact that time you know it, we're all subject to time including herself and that there are certain effects on it that it's that's going to be part of her life you might think just by reading this book that the conflict of the story is actually between herself and her son Philippe because they actually get into a very straightforward argument with each other where he decides that he's going to change the direction of his career. And we see through that how much she has pushed him in a certain direction. He's now an adult man. He's gotten married. She resents, you know, obviously the other influences in his life. She feels like um, she is getting that sense of like being displaced as a source of influence in his life as other people come in and become important to him. Um, and so as a mother, she has a variety of feelings about this. On TikTok and on the internet in general, we have um, an interesting conversation going around about boy moms and enmeshment and that sort of thing. And she definitely expresses a lot of those more toxic feelings about her son that she, um, uh, that we would call like basically enmeshment between a mother and son, which is interesting because of course it is on the heels of her feeling disunity with her own husband that she normally does feel unity with. And now she's entering into this new conflict with her son that becomes even more emotionally charged because she's not getting the sense of unity and connection that she would normally get from her spouse. So it's like really compact in a few days and in this short story, this exploration of these dynamics that are quite complex complex and can be fairly commonplace um, through in, in human experience. And it's, it's just brilliantly written and very intense, emotionally intense, I would say, very realistic in a lot of senses. And then, you know, and then quickly resolved. So that is some of the ways that I approach um, of short stories. And the main thing that I think really helps unlock a short story is kind of figuring out you know, and it's easier once you get to the end and, and tracking it backwards and you say, okay, what made this story end? And that's your resolution. And if that's your resolution, then you can go, okay, well then what's the conflict? And you kind of can like parse it out backwards. So like, I kind of didn't realize what the conflict was going to be until I got to the end when the story ended because Andre and uh, our main character had come back into unity. They, it was the scenes were very similar to the opening scenes of them being together, eating breakfast together, having a sense of resolve and community with one another. And then I said, okay, so if that's the resolution, then the conflict is actually the disunity between Andre and his wife. Well, what's the difference between them? What is she kind of railing against Andre about in the first few sections after we get to the after we get through the unity part. Oh, Andre's gotten old, but I feel like I'm still young. Then you go back and you see the time language at the very beginning of the story. You see, you know, um, obviously the title of the story includes this time language as well. And so it allows you to have a clearer sense of like, again, I think the conflict with Philippe might jump out as mo at most readers as the main conflict of the story, when in fact that is derivative of the main conflict in the story. So those are my techniques for, for reading short stories. Okay, I'm going to stop here and um, yeah, get going on the rest of my day because I have to get across town to 
do this art thing. Okay, this should be interesting because I have a very, <laughs> I have a very shaky hand. So we're trying good old fashioned holding the camera vlogging and also cameras are heavy, but it's Sunday, it's Lit Society Day um, and I'm getting ready to go. So I hope you enjoy some of the footage and I'll give you guys a recap uh, later of the books and the fun that we had. Okay, bye. Apparently my battery died when I actually got to Lit Society. So I wasn't able to get any interesting or good clips for you. I'm still learning how to vlog and it feels like a noob mistake, but I think I must have forgotten to turn my camera off and then I drove all the way there and then by the time we got all set up and we're chit-chatting and stuff, the battery was already drained. I did a good job. Um, but uh, it was really, really fun. So a bunch of my friends I already know are really good cooks and so we had a feast. As I mentioned, the premise of this literary society was to um, bring your favorite cookbook, talk about why it's your favorite cookbook, and then also uh, bring your favorite meal. So we feasted and it was wonderful. And the food ended up being like a very good combination, which we was completely unintentional because we had not, sh it was like a surprise what we brought. Um, but I think what was most interesting about the conversation was ultimately that we really focused on how we had to learn not only how to be cooks, 
which was part of an earlier part of our journey, I think, as becoming adults, but also the home ec side of things of like needing to figure out how to use all the food in your pantry or not go shopping or not have food waste or, you know, all of these not wanting to use, you know, recipes that required really obscure ingredients that you were never going to use again. So the home ec side of things is kind of what came out mostly in that conversation. Um, as far as art goes, I'm still working on prepping this canvas. So one of my techniques to save money as an artist is that I buy cheap canvases, but then I prep them with lots and lots of layers of gesso and sanding and gesso and sanding to make them a better surface to work on, which ultimately gives me a better result in the end. So my canvas is still white. I just have layers of white on my canvas, but I promise to give you guys more updates as I continue to work on that piece. I'm not 100% satisfied with the concept sketch that I did in my sketchbook. This, this bad boy right here. I think I want to add more elements to it, potentially. Um, what happened was, is I went to a uh, art our, our local museum to see a show that they had put on, which was of like high fashion, particularly a lot of, uh, I always want to say Steve McQueen, not the same as Alexander McQueen. And they had these fabulous um, earrings that were a the um, claw of a pigeon with like these pearls draped out of them. And it was so inspiring. I wanted to do this sort of like maybe skull with jewelry or bird with jewelry like just draped in gems and so anyway that's where that idea came from i found it very inspiring so we'll see i kind of want to work and develop this idea a little bit more before i fully commit to putting it on the canvas but i need to continue prepping the canvas anyway so yeah that was my weekend and i hope you enjoyed the vlog and our conversation around how to analyze short stories and i hope you enjoyed seeing the um art demo that i went to and all the other stuff that i got up to this weekend this is <laughs> i knew i wanted to vlog this weekend because i don't normally do this much interesting stuff so hopefully you enjoyed so i'll see you guys next time bye